Well, hey, all you wiretappers out there, welcome back to the Gangland Wire Studio. Got another story on tap for you, and an interesting one about Sammy the Bull Gravano. But before I get started, I got to tell you about, about something. I tried something called Magic Mind. Uh, I got them to send me some to see if I wanted to mention it to you. And, and, and you know, as you guys know, or maybe you don't know, some of my friends and relatives know, I work harder in retirement than I think I ever did on the job. Uh, certainly this researching and recording and editing every day is, uh, I mean, I like it. It's a labor of love. I enjoy doing it. Don't get me wrong. But uh, sometimes by the end of the day, I'm, I'm worn out. I need to be worn out. Now, this stuff called Magic Mind has helped me with my energy level and maybe a little more importantly with my ability to stay focused on a story because, boy, it's hard, easy to lose your focus when you, you can get all, you know, look at this, look at that and got to maintain focus. Uh, I check the ingredients and I see nothing addictive or potentially harmful. There's something called matcha in it. It has a little caffeine, but I've kind of replaced a couple of my usually five to six cups of coffee, maybe seven or eight some days, with this magic mind stuff. Uh, you know, I could drink it straight. It comes in a little two ounce bottle. It, the, the taste isn't bad. It isn't like real sweet or anything and sweet at all. Uh, it's been described as earthy when I started looking up a little bit about it. But what I do, I take a cup of oat milk, which I started using the last few years, creamy oat milk. And I mix that two ounce bottle in a cup of coffee that I sip on that as I'm researching or writing or whatever I'm doing. Now I talked to the Magic Mind folks and, and they agreed that they would get me and my wiretappers a 40% discount if you go out the next 10 days and you have to go to magicmind.co backslash gangland and that'll be in the show notes use the code of gangland20. Remember, you get 40% off, but it's only for the next 10 days. So on with the story, uh, Sammy the Bull Gravano, you know, he, he's like me. I reinvented myself uh, several times. I worked at the Ford plant on the assembly line. I, I worked as a policeman in several different operations on the police department over the next 25 years. Went to law school, I practiced law started making documentary films, and then ended up making this podcast, and I've written three books. So uh, me and Sammy the Bull got a little bit uh, in, uh, in common, I guess, on some level. Anyhow, he, you know, he, was a, he started out as a young street thug, became a, you know, a made guy. He, he rose to the underboss of the Gambino family. Uh, he had a successful business in the construction business. Uh, of course, you don't have to follow the regular rules. It's a little easier to be successful in any business. Uh, you know, then he turns and he, and he becomes a, a protected witness and witness protection, uh, hides out, starts another construction business down in Phoenix. He he's becomes a drug dealer, uh, goes back into prison, and now he's a podcast host and an entertainer, basically, a mob entertainer, pretty successful one, too. But today I want to tell you a little bit about the, a plot to kill Sammy the Bull when he first went into witness protection. My friend Ed Scarpo of the Cosa Nostra News, if you don't know that, go to their website, go to his website, Cosa Nostra News. He has a, a lot of, of really good articles. He writes well. He has a lot of contacts within especially the New York families. He's the one that, that hooked me up with uh, Michael DeLeonardo, uh, Mikey Scars. So he did an article uh, where he interviewed a guy, got him to, to respond via email named Salvatore Fat Sal Mangiaviano. Now, he, was, uh, he probably was calling or emailing back and forth from Italy. But uh, Fat Sal Mangiavano was part of a small hit team that tried to take Sammy the Bull out after he went into witness protection. And, and he described this in his podcast, I uh, can't remember the name of it now, Sit Down or something like that. Uh, a hit team from New York came to Arizona to kill me. Now, Fat Sal Mangiovano uh, was born in Italy, came to the U.S. as a child. He never got his citizenship and, and he lost his first green card that he had after a criminal conviction. He was a longtime professional mob associate criminal. He never really wanted to be a made guy. 
he, he worked with and end up leading a very more sophisticated, I won't say very, but a pretty sophisticated crew of New York thieves. And he perfected the art of breaking open bank night deposit boxes, then graduated to bank burglaries and invasion type bank robberies. You know, Willie Sutton said, why do you rob bank? Because that's where the money is. And, and that's, I would assume that's why he, he hit banks. Uh, he was, uh, he was really, was an upper echelon heist type professional criminal. It'd be worthy of a whole podcast just about him. I'd love to get him on the phone someday. Uh, I don't think I will judge him from what uh, Ed said about him. But anyhow, he was, he was known for his resourcefulness. Now this, he kind of started out, he, he's the one that perfected going into night deposit boxes in banks. He built his own homemade gaff with a three-pronged three -pronged spear on it to pull those night deposits out. You know, a bar would, would come up with thousands of dollars and, and put it in a bank bag and slide in that night deposit. It looks like you can't get it out, but he figured out how to do it. Uh, one time it, it said that he rigged a remote control drill to cut through concrete and steel. He and his organized crime pals, he had a little crew that was working with him. And they called themselves the Fat Sally Productions, which is kind of uh, tricky. Sounds like kind of a fun guy. Fat Sal, and via an email correspondence with Ed Scarpo, said that when he was a 16-year-old car thief, and that's how he started as a car thief, he met a guy named Thomas Huck Carbonaro, who was uh, connected to Sammy the Bull Lynn, was a little bit older guy, and he was, he was taken to cars that he was steal to a Gravano-connected chop shop. This was in the early 80s, and he got friendly with this guy called Huck Carbonaro, and, and then he started seeing him as a doorman at an after-hours cl after club owned by Sammy the Bull, and, you know, he kept getting friendly with him. You know, you'll make connections with people, and you kind of kind of resonate with them, and, and you end up just being friendly, and, 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 you know, maybe going out for drinks together or having coffee together like me and Steve St. John, you know, talk about two different people from different, you know, areas of life. And, and we become really good friends. Why, in 1988, in the middle of the later 80s, Fat Sally must be kind of a natural leader because he had a crew that was was uh, either chopping stolen cars or retagging stolen cars. And kind of interesting, if you remember, I did a story on Chris Passiello, uh, who was one of the guards, guys bringing him stolen cars. And through his connections here, he met a young smash and grab thief named Ton Tommy Dono. His claim was this, this is going to be his intro kind of into uh, the Gravano crime family or Gravano crew, rather. He and Tommy got arrested. Uh, it, it was a case of misidentification, but there was an off-duty cop had been mugged. And the, from the descriptions that, that the on-duty cops got, they found Fat Sal and, and Tommy Dono and, and they took him in the station. They handcuffed him to a radiator in the basement of the police station. <laughs> And, and worked him over off and on for a few hours. In the end, the, the cops brought in their officer, fellow officer, uh, probably sobered him up and bring him in. I, you know, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. And said, here, these are the guys. And they, he said, those aren't the guys. Said the guys that did are Puerto Rican. But he and Tommy Dono bonded over that. They started working together. During this time, he, he was really, you know, he was like learning more about alarm systems and, and Retagging cars, they were sending to Atlanta. He, he was kind of an earner and, and a guy that was became known as a really stealthy guy that could could do a score, and uh, nobody would know it until it was all over. 1991, he claims that a guy from the Colombo crew uh, wanted him in on a bank score, on but only if he could shut down the ADT alarm system for the entire New York area. They wanted to break into a bank and hit all the safety deposit boxes inside the, a bank in Brooklyn. And he said that Tommy Dono was what he called on record with Huck. I mean, that means he was, uh, Huck was a made guy and, and Tommy Dono was a close associate of Huck. And, and they ended up including Huck in on this score. So then they started working together and, and you know, really making some money. Uh, he went to prison for a bank robbery in Dover, Delaware in 1996. And since he wasn't a citizen, 
he ended up, he did, he did a, a bit for that. He uh, was deported afterwards back to Italy. Uh, he immediately jumped on a plane, it sounds to me like, went back to Canada and got hold of somebody. <laughs> And, and they left a car for him on the uh, uh, across the Niagara River on the New York side. And, and he took a jet ski across the uh, uh, Niagara River, jumped in the car and drove right back to uh, Manhattan or to Brooklyn actually, and where he reconnected with Tommy Dono and Huck Carbonaro. About this point in time, Tommy had a case and he was about to go into the penitentiary. He said, you know, after he reappears and everything, he's got this reputation and Huck took him out for what he described as a walk and talk. And we know what that means. You know, you don't want to be overheard. This is really sensitive. So you go out and walk around and, and do your talking. Huck asked him to join a crew that was going to go find and kill Sammy the Bull Gravano. And he claimed that he'd gotten the order from Peter Gotti. Now, that's all, you know, Peter Gotti had been to the penitentiary. There was some tape where where he says, you know, this is a bill that's got to be paid, you know, inferring to kill Sammy the Bull, of course, who was a protected government witness at this time. And so he's bringing our friend Fat Sal Mangiovano, Mangiovano in on this score or this caper, uh, mainly because he's a guy that can get it done and, and has all these technical things. So through a relative of Sammy the Bull, and they include his brother-in-law in on this hit team, and he finds out Eddie, Eddie Gar Garofolo, I believe, something like that. Uh, anyhow, they include his brother-in-law in on the team, and he finds out that he's, we're living down in Phoenix. He's got this little construction company of some kind. They want to please their new boss, Gotti. There's talk about this. You know, they're doing this for the Gottis. Uh, Sammy will tell on his podcast how he has this fantasy about how he killed these men, but he has to get them in his house and explain the rules about how you never hurt somebody in front of their family. You never hurt a member of their family. And I, I'm not sure where that comes from. I didn't really take the time to go listen to the podcast. You, you guys can go listen to it. If you want, you may already have. He's immensely popular. So uh, anyhow, uh, during this time, Gravano had actually even given an interview to the Phoenix newspaper and left the witness protection and just laying low. Gotti's just felt like that he was rubbing in their face. I mean, this guy, he loves the media. He never, you know, don't, it's like Rudy Giuliani, don't get between him and a camera that's, that's rolling, especially a live camera that's rolling at the national media. Do not get between Sammy the Bull or Rudy Giuliani uh, and a camera that's rolling. In response to the Bulls podcast, Fat Sal and Giovanni told Ed Scarpo, he said, you know, I know the rules uh, of Cosa Nostra. I'm not a member, but we never planned on hitting Sammy the Bull in front of his family or to harm any member of his family. He had a member of his family that really was ratting him out uh, in a way as to where he was, he was helping with that, uh, was on that crew. And he said, we knew that the FBI would come down very hard and big time on any hit on Gravano, but said they were prepared for that. And uh, in, in his mind, he, I, it was really interesting. He like, he, he's not a made guy, but he's a close associate. And, and, he, and he told Ed, he said, you know, he said, I understand the rules. And he said, but if anybody violates their oath, you know, they're no longer members of the Cosa Nostra. They're no longer protected by the rules. And, and even though he wasn't any longer protected by the rules, you know, that's, uh, you know, it, it still, they said, I would not hurt a family member for sure. And try not to kill him in front of a family member. That happens once in a while. Uh, uh, crazy Joey Gallo, sometimes when they cowboy things like that, they can't set you down someplace, then they end up killing you in front of your family. It's all, you know, it's all circumstantial, isn't it? So let's get into this plot. They, they went to Arizona. They got actual Arizona driver's licenses through the DMV down there, according to Fat Sal. Uh, said they located his construction company office. They, uh, they bought some black market guns down there and stashed them. This was all in uh, December, uh, November and December. They went down there 
more than once during this time trying to, to set this plan in motion. They're really careful about it, really cautious because of the heat that was going to come down on it. They came back later on. They planted some litany de listening devices on Gravano, and I don't get the I didn't get the real details on that. But I put a tap on his phone. You know, you start getting a pattern. You can you can learn a lot about. You know, pretty soon you learn that a guy always goes to the gym a certain time, or you learn that that they, you know, like Sammy the Bull has got a, a grandkid that that plays in a little league team, or or that he and his wife always, you know, will meet you at a certain restaurant. He likes to go to a particular restaurant. And, and so that way you don't have to follow people around. You just pick up these little tidbits and then you go wait at that place. Or you look at that place, you scope out that place. Is this a good place to hit him? Uh, you know, now they knew, they knew that he would know them. So it was really hard for them to get close to him. They even came up with some kind of a little homemade bomb. Uh, one person described it as something that jumped up and started shooting shotgun shells. That didn't make sense to me. They did work on some kind of a homemade bomb that they were going to plant at some place where he would be close to. Uh, reading between the lines, it looks to me like it was, it would be like a bunch of dynamite and a stop sign like that judge Falcone over in uh, Sicily. It probably copied off of that or like the idiot, uh, 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 green dude, uh, not Michael Green. Uh, uh, all of a sudden I've, I've lost his first name, but green dude in Cleveland, they, they planted a bomb in a car next to his car. And then when he got there, set it off, but that didn't seem to work. They couldn't seem to get that together. Uh, you know, during this time, they're going back and forth and Sammy the Bull, he, he gets arrested in this ecstasy charge. And so they really don't get a chance to, to pull all this off. Also, Sal gets arrested for some other bank burglars and a racketeering conspiracy uh, called it the bank crew case. It's the third time the feds have prosecuted and, and, and he's looking for another sentence and then deportation. Then middle of that, he gets another, a fourth federal case because some other cooperator talking on him on a racketeering conspiracy on a armed takeover bank robbery. It's just a little more, you know, it's, you know, bank burglar is one thing, but an armed takeover is a much stiffer sentence. Once interviewed a local, you know, Missouri guy that took a, uh, he took a hit for like 14 years, and then the uh, uh, the state turned around and prosecuted him for the same bank robberies, and they gave him 25 years. So when I interviewed him, he would have already been out, according to the uh, federal sentence he got. But when the state came back in and prosecuted him again, what you can do in Missouri, oh, it's one of the few states you can do it, but you know, I, I digress. Uh, so he's got this case, and and he's, he's like... Uh, He's in a lockup in, in Brooklyn with other mob guys are under this Eddie Garofola's in there. He said, I noticed that he was nervous and, and he, his quote was, I could smell the fear about him. He, he said, that's when he became paranoid. Uh, it just uh, like, uh oh, there's something going on here. And, and he's looking at another case. He's starting to look at, he realizes maybe uh, the rest of his life in the penitentiary or the majority of it. And, and he told Ed Scarpo, uh, Sal said, you know, I made a hasty decision to cooperate. He said, I can give you a hundred excuses, but I won't. At the end of the day, by the street code, I'm still a rat or a stool pigeon. I don't like it, but it's the truth. I crossed that line. I can't take it back. I won't make up any half-baked excuses and blame other guys. His other guys stood up. These are the rules of the street, not just Coast and Nostra, but the rules of the street. You know, he said, I was selected because I had a reputation for a meticulous planner. Uh, you know, I'd never talked before, so they trusted me. You know, what, what's a guy to do? So he ends up testifying. Now, now the hit team, there was a Louis, big Louis Valerio, who was a capo in the Gambino family. Uh, there was uh, Frankie Fab, Frankie Fapiano was a Gambino soldier. Uh, there was Edward, cousin Eddie Garofola, who was the brother-in-law married to Sammy the Bull's sister, and Thomas Huck Carbonaro, and another guy named John Matera. All those guys, they had a big 
you know, Rico case, and, and they actually they put together for other cases, other murders. They were involved in in murder of a Frederick Weiss and uh, another guy, I can't remember, oh, Frank Parasole. So, uh, and, you know, other uh, extortions and, and uh, union, pro union uh, racketeering and things like that. And so they put, uh, he helped put this whole crew uh, with uh, Huck Carbonaro and Eddie Garofola in the penitentiary for a long time. And, and he's out there now uh, getting older. You know, you gotta admire a guy. I have to admire him that he said, I, I don't have any excuses. I don't have, you know, I just did it, you know, right or wrong. I just did it. A hasty decision, but you know, once you make that decision, you can't come back on it. So that's the story of the failed uh, attempt on the life of Sammy the Bull Gravano. He's an interesting guy. <laughs> he is an, it, he's more interesting than Francise, it seems to me like, because uh, he's done it all. Folks, I really appreciate you listening to me, and uh, don't forget to hit me up on Venmo or buy me a cup of coffee. Hit my uh, website, Gangland Wire. Got some movies for sale. I can I rent them. I figured out how to rent them to you uh, for a dollar ninety nine. And uh, you know, I, I don't really have anything else to sell here. It's been great talking to you. Don't forget to watch out for motorcycles. And if you got any problems with PTSD, if you've been in the military, go to the VA and, and go to their website, uh, PTSD, and just Google PTSD and VA and check their website out and get that hotline number. Thanks a lot, folks.